Good morning. This is Bill from Monte Europa, Naples on a, you know, kind of muggy Florida morning. Summer's on the way. It's, oh boy, we're in for some really crappy weather over the next few months. Our lovely winter is evaporating before our eyes, and that's a shame. Uh, but, you know, the town is emptying out. We're able to go to the grocery store now and actually get stuff. It's, you know, the shelves haven't been picked clean by northern visitors who go through the Whole Foods like they're preparing for a hurricane. You walk in there and it's cobwebs on the shelf if you go in January. Uh, but anyway, things are getting back to normal around here. And I do have this 2006 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Roadster. Uh, you know, the SL is a real halo car for Mercedes-Benz, very much a signature car. Has a very long history, dating back many generations, all the way to 1954, uh, when uh, it came out with the Gullwing, the, you know, very, very famous car that became quite iconic. Uh, actually was inspired by an American, but we'll get into that in a little while. And uh, there has been debate all the way through 2017 as to what SL actually stood for. Uh, for many years, you'd go to the company website and it would say Sport Light or Sport Light Weight. Well, in 2017, they went through the archives, they came up with some kind of find, and uh, it is now determined to have been a super light. So that is what SL stands for. Uh, you know, Mercedes-Benz has a bit of a troubled history, not quite as troubled as BMW, but still kind of troubled. And to many extents, uh, it sort of mirrors the modern history of Germany. Uh, sometimes they're very unfairly criticized for being war collaborators and, you know, Nazi supporters, which of course is true. I mean, it would be like saying General Motors, you know, had nothing to do with the American war effort. I mean, Germany is at war, Mercedes-Benz is their biggest car maker, and, uh, you know, of course there's going to be some collaboration between the two. In fact, uh, Hitler himself was buddies with some uh, assistant director at Mercedes, real good buddies, so much so that uh, he was picked up at the prison in 1925 where he had served a stint for something uh, by one of the associate directors of Mercedes. Probably looked a little bit like the scene from the Blues Brothers where Elwood traded the uh, Cadillac for a microphone. But anyway, I digress. If you go back to the start of Mercedes-Benz, it all begins with basically two guys and then a few ancillary guys. And uh, one of them is, of course, Carl Benz, a very brilliant young man who came from very humble roots to start what is probably the most important car company company in the world, and then an industrialist named Gottlieb Daimler, uh, who had a good buddy named Wilhelm um, Maybach, that's a name you might recognize, <clears throat> and uh, they, they sort of worked independently to develop motorized vehicles, but it is Benz, Carl Benz, who essentially came out with and patented the first automobile uh, back in 1885 which of course is an epic landmark in the uh, evolution of mankind, if you will. And that, that automobile used some fairly important modern stuff like rack and pinion steering, tube frame, internal combustion engine, uh, water cooling, you know, really modern things that are still being used today. And it was the first car that was really designed to be a car. There may have been other motorized vehicles before it, but this thing was designed to be a car. And uh, as a result, uh, Mr. Benz is credited with uh, coming up with that. A little bit of an interesting story. They, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to ramble and ramble. Uh, Carl was named to, uh, he was married to a woman named Bertha, uh, who obviously was a very formidable German woman. Uh, when they got married, she immediately squeezed out five kids and, uh, you know, got herself involved with the company. They used her dowry uh, to uh, buy out uh, some partner that Benz didn't like, so she became the partner. And in 1888, she took this Benz patent wagon, apparently without Carl's knowledge, but you know, who knows. And she drove it on a 65 mile uh, trip to see her mother with a couple of kids in tow. And you know, along the way she did stuff like invent the brake linings and live marketing. So uh, she was obviously, you know, a woman <laughs> Who would be very interesting. She really did invent brake linings. She was going down hills and found the brakes to be quite stuttery and unpleasant. So she stopped at some bicycle store and uh, made the uh, mechanic there put uh, leather liners on the brake blocks, which are, you know, essentially the first brake lining. So, a uh, pretty cool woman. She also used the trip for live marketing. It became uh, a bit of a famous thing. People, you know, spoke of it, uh, you know, as a as sort of a land 
landmark in the development of the automobile. They still run a vintage rally along the same route today uh, to celebrate that trip. And uh, obviously she was, uh, you know, pretty crafty broad. Anyway, uh, you know, this all went on. Daimler, he came up with his own stuff. He made the first uh, uh, motorized motorcycle, if you will, uh, you know, created boats and cars and all kinds of stuff as they went through the years. And you got up to 1900, and I'm sorry, I know this is probably all tedious, but the hell with it. I'm going to try to condense it as much as I can. In 1900, there was a guy named, uh, and what the hell was his name, Jelinek, uh, Emil Jelinek. Uh, you know, sort of a gadabout, uh, wealthy the hobnobber who sold cars and other things to make a living. Very nice guy and a neat guy. He was Austrian, I believe. And he ordered 36 of Daimler's new vehicle. And for that, he had a couple of conditions. And one of them was that the vehicle be named after his daughter, uh, who was, uh, of course, named Mercedes. So uh, 1901 or two, I don't remember which, kind of brought about the first Mercedes automobile. And, uh, th you know, that went on for a while. Both Benz, uh, well, Daimler died in like 1900, but the company went on. And, uh, you know, Benz developed stuff. Uh, Daimler's company developed stuff. The war came along, as it tends to. Uh, they, they didn't suffer as bad as BMW afterwards. They were still making car bodies and stuff. Uh, I think they also made um, uh, bicycles. And, you know, I don't know if any of those are still around, but I bet if they are, they have really over-engineered and complicated cup holders. Anyway, after the war, all the German car industry kind of had to come together to survive and move forward. And in 1926, Daimler and Benz finally came together as one company and marketed cars under the name Mercedes-Benz. And the rest is, as they say, history. Now, they went on to, you know, be a big part of the German war effort. Uh, Hitler always drove around in big Benzes. That was his thing. They confiscated, the Nazis confiscated everybody's cars in the beginning of the war and turned them into staff cars for the SS and, uh, you know, put them otherwise towards the uh, war effort. But what the hell would you expect? I mean, it Again, Germany is at war. I mean, it's not much different from the United States. So, uh, Mercedes did have to pay out some money for some, you know, questionable labor tactics they used during the war, but otherwise they survived fairly intact. They did not suffer nearly as much as BMW, and uh, they kept rolling along after the war. Fast forward to 1954, a little bit before that, a guy named Max Hoffman, American importer, uh, you know, felt that there was a market in the United States for uh, sort of sporty and lightweight racy vehicles. And of course that was true. I mean, if you storm the beach at Normandy, you know, you're not going to get very excited driving a Packard to uh, to the grocery store. You want something a bit more entertaining. And uh, of course that was the birth of the British car market, the revolution, all the old Triumphs and MGs, that sort of thing. And Mercedes came along with this SL, uh, which was truly destined for the American market and uh, still continues to be destined for the American market. You know, they sell it everywhere, but truly America is where it's all at. Uh, you go through many different generations of these uh, super light cars, none of which are really super light, maybe the first one. And finally, we come along to this one, uh, the R230 chassis. And it's where I say sort of Mercedes-Benz started turning uh, the SL into a supercar. Now, I get a lot of flack for that because obviously it's not a 700 horsepower exotic. But what I mean by that is it's a car that cruises at 150 miles an hour on the Autobahn. It's fast, it handles, it performs. Uh, it is really and truly uh, a fantastic legacy to Mercedes cars of the past, uh, you know, that uh, were built for the same purpose, driving quickly, safely, uh, you know, in a very advanced machine that did everything it was supposed to do. Uh, this one is finished in Orion Blue. It's a color that I haven't seen before or since. I sold this car to a very nice gentleman, oh God, going on five or six years ago, uh, locally, and I remember when we got it in, that was, I was over at Auto House then, I thought, wow, look, I mean, you know, where the hell are you gonna find an Orion Blue SL? And, you know, we sold it to him, moved on, years go by, we finally just get it back in yesterday. Uh, that, that's how clean this thing is. I really didn't have to do anything to it to market. I had a couple things on order, but for the most part, the thing came in exactly the way I sold it to him. 
and I haven't seen the color since uh, since I had sold it to him. So this is obviously a pretty rare piece. Uh, you can see the beautiful ovoid headlights in the front, the uh, dominating uh, Mercedes star in the grill. That's uh, a uh, big scary logo where Mercedes is going to dominate on the land, the sea, and the air, and they have one prong pointing at each. Uh, that was uh, actually conceived by Daimler way back when. Uh, you can see the sport wheels. This is really only two years that you could get these wheels, and most of them came on the SL 600s, the V12, sort of a phone dial looking curvy thing. Very, very attractive rim on this car. Uh, the little vents in the side fenders, the vents at the top of the hood, all hearkening back to earlier SL models. Lovely swooping lines going towards the high back end, a little stubby rear with the long front. Uh, you know, you can call it a German Corvette, you can call it what you want, but it is a very sporty vehicle. And um, yeah, really, really hedonistic. I mean, this thing is not meant for any duty other than pleasuring uh, the, when, okay, get your minds out of the gutter, you know what I mean, pleasuring the, the motorist in terms of his commutes or weekend fun, so, anyway, let's start in the trunk, you guys got to be sick of hearing me ramble by now, here you can see the aluminum hardtop is folded neatly into place, now if I press this red button, Nothing's going to happen. Oh, it will. Okay, so it lifts the hardtop up, gives you access to this partition, which you can then move forward, and you get access to your cargo. You could even fit a set of golf clubs in there with the partition closed and the top down. I know this because we've tried it. Uh, underneath this panel there is your spare, but you get a pretty good-sized trunk for a uh, two-seat open roadster. Uh, get that partition back into place. It has to click these little micro switches on each side so it knows everything's good. You can put the uh, top back down and close the trunk, which will suck itself down automatically. Have a look under the hood. So I know I've been a little short on videos lately. I apologize for that. We've kind of had a record sales month, which is great. Uh, cars are flying out of here at the new location, which is quite comforting. It was getting to the point where I was making soup out of ketchup and water. So at least we're eating hamburgers again. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we've been busy with that. I've taken a couple little trips. I went on a horrific little weekend cruise that I will never, ever do again. Uh, a little three-day cruise to the Bahamas. It was, it was like a concentration camp victim tour. Anyway, I won't get into that. But uh, under here, you're going to find a five-liter uh, V8 engine, uh, 302 horse, very, very torquey, very peppy, a fantastic bulletproof V8 engine in this car. Mercedes knows how to build a V8, quite unlike BMW, who frankly does not. They should stick to inline sixes. Uh, this thing is exactly what you want to find under here. It's not over the top. It's not too little. Uh, it's made into a very smooth shifting uh, five-speed. It might be a seven in this year. Now, we'll check when we get in. Anyway, the, the, the same basic transmission with a couple extra gears if it's the 7. And a very bulletproof drivetrain from front to back. Uh, you can see, like, the little sensors here at the top of the uh, strut towers. That controls that ABC Sport suspension. All this is the ABS stuff. Very fancy brakes on this car. And for a modern car, it has a nicely uncomplicated engine compartment. Uh, it has two batteries, this car, kind of like a motorhome. It's got a starter battery and a house battery. Uh, this guy was just fanatical about servicing the car. You can see it has a Mercedes battery, so he paid way more for one than he needed to at the dealership and uh, kept everything real nice. So that is just lovely under the hood. Also, this thing has been garaged since new. I mean, you can see there's no crust on the headlights. There's no anything. I mean, this thing is just so supple and nice from having been indoors its whole life. Have a look at the interior before we get the top up. So the accessory windscreen, very nicely in place. It folds down or flips up like that. It's connected to this roll bar, which can be lifted either manually or uh, in the event of calamity, that thing comes shooting up like an airbag as part of the SRS system and keeps your uh, head from getting crushed. So very nice setup there. Of course, also this front windshield uh, pillar is uh, incredibly strong and wouldn't collapse under uh, any circumstances. So very, very, you know, safe convertible. Press this little arrow here and it gives you access to uh, the rear package shelf. You're probably not going to fit any Canadians back there, but they're going to try. 
they're going to try. Don't let them, but they might try. Uh, they've got little seat belts for your cargo that you can take out and clip into that guy down there. So if you have something you want to lay across the package shelf, you can neatly put it into place, you know, like Basset Hound or Machine Gun, whatever it is you want to stuff in there. Uh, under here, this little compartment, you've got a place to put, uh, you know, pretty nice sized uh, handgun and then uh, obviously your CD changer if anyone's still using those. Go around to the other side. Up the big twice pipes at the bottom. This thing does have a lovely rumble at idle. Not unlike a Corvette, actually. All right, so press that. This seat's going to go forward. We got another little compartment here. And there we find a lovely set of books. Nice stuff. And then an extensive set of service records with this car, spanning years and years and years of getting hosed at the dealer. So uh, this guy really kept the car up to snuff, which is nice to see. Get that back in there. Good to go. Let's see if I can get the keys out of my pocket before we get in. Okay, you see these beautiful leather seats. They're not what I would call sport seats, but they are very, very comfy, very supportive. They have nice big bolsters there to keep you uh, planted in them. And at the same time, keep you very, very comfortable on a long trip. Nobody balances seats the way Mercedes does. I'm fire this thing up. You hear that V8 growl to life, which is just absolutely lovely. Uh, okay, here on the cluster, you can. This is one of my complaints with this Generation SL. I have never liked the instrument cluster. I don't like this weird sort of overhang. It's you know obviously made to keep the glare off the gauges, and that's all great. But it looks like the Sydney Opera House or some sort of crustacean eyes staring at you, and it just isn't my thing. I think they could have done that prettier. Uh, you see, you got a temp gauge. You got 160 mile an hour speedo. You got your uh, 6500 red line on the tack there on the right. You got your fuel. A uh, little driver information center here where you can scroll through different features like navigation, change your things. You see this display is a little wonky. Uh, I have the parts to change that to fix that up. So uh, we'll have that change. But again, I didn't want to hold this car up. I just wanted to get it up here and take the opportunity to ramble on about the Mercedes Nazi war machine stuff. Uh, this has the optional wood and leather steering wheel. Lovely with the multifunction. You've got your automatic headlights over here. You've got your 83-way power seats here with memory and heating, all very nice, a little trunk release, your windows, beautiful, uh, true wood, sort of, you know, the way everything comes together in an SL is just so nice. And frankly, it better be for the 90 grand they cost. Uh, you know, everything lovely and proper there with the dash. I think this is kind of a faux leather. I don't think it's actually leather. Uh, if it is, it's, it's just not pretty enough. It's, it's fine, don't get me wrong, but uh, if that really is leather, they should have picked a better leather. But I'm quite sure it's vinyl for the sake of lasting. Uh, down here you've got Mercedes-Benz command unit, cockpit management and data system type thing. Uh, doesn't have SAT, it does have nav. Uh, you can hook a telephone up to it. Uh, somewhere in here, I don't know. I don't know. I don't see a dongle, so no guarantees, but uh, if you can get Bluetooth or not, but otherwise uh, you could probably get one of those old vintage phones and pretend it still works. But anyway, nice to see. We also get our audio. Let's see what we got on the radio this morning. Is that Tears for Fears? I don't know, maybe a little too hippy for me. Uh, Jack, that's the single CD. Oh, Tears for Fears is fine. Uh, we've got these overcomplicated cup holders. Lovely, still works smooth. Probably means they were never used. You've got your automatic climate control here. All very nice stuff. Uh, very lovely wood and leather shifter. Uh, comfort and sport setting on the transmission. Let's see what we have for gears. We'll answer that question. Three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so it is the seven speed in this car. They were using the five and the AMGs because of all the torque. I think it's kind of a more 
is sort of brutal tranny, that five speed, but this is gonna be fine for this engine and for gas mileage. Uh, ESP, electronic stability program, that's your traction control on the car. Uh, with this uh, aromatic system, and I'm pretty sure it's all hydraulic, not air in this car, uh, you can raise the car and lower it if you have ground clearance issues. So I press that once, you see ABC, uh, that's uh, active body control, <clears throat> vehicle raising. We press it twice, and this thing's going to sky like uh, Bigfoot. So let's get outside so you can have a look at that. Yeah, have a look at that. So now you're ready for a monster truck rally in this thing. When I go to the auction sometimes and, you know, see one of these cars, I leave it in that setting because, frankly, it looks ridiculous, and I think it might freak people out. So maybe I can get the car for a better deal. Uh, I also use it when I'm loading the car onto a truck because, uh, famously, everybody scrapes the front bumpers on these things. So if you need a little ground clearance, that's the way to go. I got the car back down to a normal height. Just like that, and we're good to go. Here's your power mirror switch. Uh, this is a motion sensor turn off, so uh, if the car's getting towed, God forbid, you hit that and it won't set the alarm off going down the road. Uh, ABC Sport uh, suspension. That's gonna, again, active body control. Uh, this is gonna stiffen up the springs. It uses a series of uh, hydraulic struts, if you will, instead of traditional coilovers. So it, it will, with high pressure, fill up those struts to change the dampening all over the car independently of all the other struts. And what that's doing is keeping the car incredibly level. So if I'm taking a super hard left turn, uh, it's going to pump up the right side to keep the body even. Uh, it's ditto the uh, right turn, you know, pump up the left side. Also, heavy acceleration, if the nose wants to come up, it's going to pump up the rears. Heavy braking, it's going to pump up the fronts, doing everything it can to keep the car smooth and level so your champagne glass stays, you know, nice and dry, or you don't spill your coffee everywhere. Uh, you get a little glove box over here, there's our quick guide books. Uh, back here is the flapper for the top. Real quick, I can run the roll bar up using uh, using one of the buttons there. Looks better without the windscreen attached. Some guys run around like that with that up to look sporty. I don't, but some guys do. And uh, otherwise, all very nice stuff there. Uh, if I want to run the top, I just push down on this flapper. You see the uh, trunk will come up from the reverse. Everything folds forward. And up comes this beautiful, quick, folding hardtop. Seals very nicely into place. Everything looking good. All the windows. And now we are ensconced in a very nice coupe. You can see the way the audio has changed. Uh, that's just exactly how tight and well-fitting this thing is. Uh, you know, you really wouldn't know the difference now between this and a car with a permanently fixed roof. Let's go for a spin. So every SL comes out with uh, a quick Ben's patents. He patented the spark plug. Pretty key, man, neat stuff. The water radiator. Man, was that guy ahead of his time. But his, I, the most impressive to me is the wife making the brake linings. I mean, for the love of God, why can't I get that lucky? The only thing my girl ever made me was a really bad egg sandwich. Anyway, uh, going down the road in an SL is absolutely lovely. I mean, you just feel in command of the universe. You've got all this power under the hood. You've got incredibly responsive steering. Uh, you've got a uh, suspension that's beautifully connected to the pavement. And at the same time, you feel luxurious. It's not overly stiff. Uh, you know, the only car I could compare it to in terms of its versatility is the 911. And I don't mean like the track 911. It's just a standard 911, which is the kind of car that you can, you know, drive to Whole Foods and pick up a overpriced roasted chicken. Uh, or, you know, take to the racetrack and turn in a pretty competitive time. Uh, the SL is like that. You know, it doesn't have exactly the same track credibility as the 911, obviously. But it has probably more Autobahn credibility in terms of being a grand tour, uh, you know, taking a German orthodontist to work at 150 miles an hour so you can get crabby with the nurses. Listen to that thing, how? 
incredible. I mean, what a lovely, smooth, beautifully running car. I mean, absolutely connected to the driver. You just feel this, uh, you know, again, it's heavy. I mean, you feel the substantialness of the vehicle, but it does such an incredible job of feeling nimble at the same time. And that's just good engineering. Uh, we're going to get into the sun. So look, anyway, I've gone on too long, so I'm going to wrap it up. But I can tell you that this particular SL is a standout among standouts. I mean, the way this has been maintained, the color combination, uh, it's gorgeous, and it's the one you should buy. I say that without any hesitation. Uh, Mercedes, their history, fascinating. You know, I have a look at it. I read up on it. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on, and it's more complicated than the German word for salad dressing. But uh, it is uh, very interesting to read about. So uh, if you have an interest in this car, give us a call. 239-298-8000 on the web at aenaples.com Thank you so much for having a look. Let's hammer it. We appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And we'll see you with the next one. Take care.